Welcome to our, our talk on vascular plants and their structure and function. I've included here some pictures of my favorite flowers, hydrangeas. And hydrangeas, as you guys might know, come in a variety of different colors from pink, white, purple, blue, and various shades in between. And this is actually due to the pH in the soil. So how you change the pH, if it's more acidic, it'll make the flowers pink. And if it's more basic, it'll make the flowers blue. And then there's a spectrum in the middle where you can get light pink, dark pink, uh, pale blue, light blue, um, dark blue, purple, all these different colors. And so why am I mentioning this? Um, because we're gonna talk about soil amongst various other aspects of plants in this lecture. So let's get started. This is chapter 19 in your textbook. In our last lecture, we talked about angiosperms. And remember, these are our flowering plants. And we talked about their reproduction and some things about their structure. And we talked about the flower and the different parts of the flower and what they're responsible for. So now we're going to talk about the two categories of angiosperms. We have our monocots and our dicots. And they actually um, have different structures. And we're going to talk through each of those differences. The first structure we see in the plant's development is in the embryonic leaves or cotyledon. Um, cotyledon, I say it really fast, so it might be hard to understand what I'm saying, but these are basically the embryonic leaves that are present within the seed. So these will become the first leaves uh, of the plant once it sprouts. And if you're a monocot, mono mean one, cot meaning cotyledon, so one cotyledon, you only have one embryonic leaf which is seen here, that kind of light green mass. But if you're a dicot, it means you have two dicotyledon, two cotyledon. So you have two of these embryonic leaves in your seed. And so that's the, the first major difference we see between monocots and dicots. Within the, the dicot uh, category, they're actually not a monophyletic group. And so remember, a monophyletic group is when you have a common ancestor and all of its descendants. They do not all share the same common ancestor. So when I'm referring to dicots for the rest of this uh, presentation, I'm going to be referring to the eudicots. So eu means true dicots, so true dicots, because they are the only monophyletic grouping within dicots, but they're also the largest grouping. So just keep that in mind. A next major difference we see is in the leaf structure. So in monocots, we usually see these parallel um, veins within the leaves. And so like this is you know, our leaf and you can see these veins kind of running straight from where the stem would be down to the end of the leaf, right? So, but in dicots, generally they have that branching structure. So when we you know, draw a leaf, generally as a, as a child or even as an adult, we're drawing it kind of like what we see here where the branches have a central, um, they might have a central vein, and then the rest of the veins kind of branch out from there. We can also look at the stem. So within the stem, uh, they have, we have a lot of different types of tissue. We're gonna talk about that in a couple more slides, but one of the main things we have are these vascular bundles. And remember we talked about vascular tissue were these kind of tube-like structures that carry water and nutrients up and down the plant from the roots to the shoots and back. And so in monocots, the, the structure, these bundles are actually randomly dispersed within the stem. So you can see how these dots in this monocot here, they're kind of ra seem random, seem more haphazard, when, especially when you compare it to the uh, vascular bundles present within the dicots. In the, in the eudicots, there's a clear structure here, right? There's a clear pattern. And the, the vascular tissue are these pink uh, dots here. So there's a clear structure in the dicots that's not present in the eudicots, uh, I mean, in the, in the monocots when we're looking at the vascular tissues. We can also look at the flowers. So in monocots, flowers tend to um, 
have multiples of three. So they'll have three petals, um, three stamen or six stamen. Everything's kind of multiples of three. Whereas in dicots, they generally are multiples of four or five. And then we can also look at the roots. So in monocots, generally the roots are fibrous, which, and they branch out. So you can see in this image that the root is more like what you would normally draw if you were a child, right? They kind of branch out from a central point at the end of the stem. But in dicots, they have what's uh, called a tap root. So you have a main root, and we'll talk a lot more about what these things mean in a minute, but essentially you have a main root that kind of digs deeper into the soil and then you have roots that kind of branch off from that main root and then they have a little bit more branching but it's not a branching root because there's that central main root that digs deeper into the soil than branching roots do some examples of you know monocots and dicots we have our uh, for monocots we have palm trees orchids lilies and grass um, are some examples of monocots. Some examples of dicots are roses, uh, coffee trees, uh, like okay, cow trees, apple trees, strawberry plants, maple trees, etc. Uh, carrots are, are a good example as well. So now we're going to just dig deep into the structure. So this is of all vascular plants. Um, there are some variations here and there. However, the general information we're going through here applies to the vast majority of vascular plants that you'll see out there. So plants have a couple of different tissue types. They have three tissue types. The first, if you're going out to in, are our dermal tissues. And this is essentially their, uh, almost like their epithelium, like their skin, right? This is the tissue that lies on the outside facing the environment of the, the plant. And this is the job of the dermal tissue is to cover the plant and protect it from um, evaporation, protect it from disease, protect it from uh, overheating, right? The sensitive tissues lie underneath it. So the dermis is, is responsible for making sure that it protects those sensitive tissues. The epidermis is a monolayer of very tightly packed thin cells. So you can see it here. It's, hard, it's a little hard to see, but this top layer of cells, let's get it red top layer of cells here that's a little bit like a darker green in color on this image and then these cells down here are our epidermal cells or our dermal cells and they're responsible for producing the cuticle and the cuticle is this waxy substance that basically covers the top part of the cell and the bottom I mean the top part of the leaf and if you've ever been in Georgia you've seen these types of leaves where they look really really waxy you touch them, they're real slick. Um, that waxy look to them is the cuticle. And the cuticle is responsible for preventing evaporation of water from the leaves or minimizing evaporation of water from the leaves and also to protect against infection. There, there are no cuticle present on the actual roots. Um, there's a cuticle present on the leaves and on the stem, but there's no cuticle on the roots because the cuticle prevents water from leaving the evaporation but it also prevents water from being absorbed right because it's a waxy layer so water just runs off of leaves whereas in the roots you want to absorb water you want to absorb nutrients and if you covered the roots in a cuticle you wouldn't be able to do that so there's no cuticle on the roots but there's a cuticle on the leaves and um, a cuticle on the stem the uh, dermis is also responsible for gas exchange. So on the top part of the leaf, and we'll talk a lot more in deep depth about this, there is that waxy layer to prevent from um, evaporation. But on the bottom other side of the leaf, there are actually these openings. And I couldn't include a picture because I just can't stand looking at them. But essentially, there are these, these hole like openings at the bottom of the, the leaf and they're responsible for gas exchange. And um, they have, but on the flanking these openings, they have these kind of cells called guard cells. Let me try to color it in. Ugh. Okay. So that colored in area is supposed to be the guard cells. And then that middle area is supposed to be the hole in the middle. So the guard cells, when they, um, when they swell, 
it allows for the the pore to open and that allows gas to exchange, but also some water is lost due to evaporation. Once the fluid uh, leaves those guard cells and they no, are no longer swollen and they, they go down in size, it closes the hole, it closes the stoma. So the um, water is no longer being, um, is no longer leaving the cell, no longer leaving the plant, but you also um, are not able to uh, get any gas exchange as well. So these holes are constantly opening and closing depending on different environmental conditions. And these are very, very important, um, like I said, for gas exchange because we need gases for photosynthesis, right? We need CO2 for photosynthesis to make sugars. We also need oxygen so that we can undergo cellular respiration. So we need gas exchange. That's why you need them to open and then close when not needed. Also, many plants have these cork cells on their stems and roots, and these are of uh, also, these are dead cells. They're also waxy, but they are far more dense. And many of us know this. Uh, a good example is tree bark, right? Tree bark, you know, was very thick, hard, dense. Um, sometimes it can be quite waxy, but um, it's responsible for protecting the plant as well protecting them from uh, predation, protecting them from disease. Also, in some cases, protecting like large trees and areas that are prone to fires from fire and also preventing them from losing water as well. And an, an example of these cork cells is here, All right? So they're very densely packed waxy cells. There's a another type of dermis that's just more present on the, um, on the stems and the roots than they are um, on the leaves. The next type of tissue that we're going to talk about is the vascular tissue of the plant. And this is essentially the circulatory system of the plant, right? They don't have a heart or anything like that that pumps blood, but they do have these tube-like structures that transport nutrients and water wherever it needs throughout the plant. So it's like a circulatory system in plants. But it's also responsible for removal of waste. So it doesn't just transport the good things, but it also removes the bad things, which is just as critical as getting the nutrients you need is the removal of waste. The, uh, we have two types of vascular tissue. We have our xylem, which runs from the, stem, from the roots to the shoots. Then we have our phloem, which runs from the shoots to the roots. And we'll talk a whole bunch more about those in a minute. Um, some examples, um, if you've all seen, if you've ever seen a plant, you've all seen these uh, vascular tissue. The lines present on these leaves are the veins, which is the vascular tissue, the xylem and the phloem. And also here, all this branching material, uh, well, branching you see on this plant on, are these veins here, like this larger one. And all these little ones here are all veins a part of this uh, vascular tissue. So just to quiz yourself, the one on the right, this one, do you think that's a monocot or a dicot? Same thing with this one, monocot or dicot. So number one, monocot or dicot. Number two, monocot or dicot based on just the leaves. See if you can figure it out. So also the uh, xylem and phloem, if you wanna see them kind of a, a cross section, and a dicot looks something like this. So the xylem is the blue material in these images. And the phloem is the pink material. Let's see, we'll use this one. Pink or purplish material there. So this is basically just a cross section of a stem just to show you where the xylem and phloem are. And I knew that this was a dicot because they are structured evenly in like a nice key pattern, right? So our xylem, what is the xylem? The xylem, like I mentioned, run from the roots to the shoots. And they essentially are responsible for transporting mostly water and dissolved minerals that the roots pull in from the soil and move it up to the, the shoots or the leaves and the stem, which aren't readily, aren't generally readily uh, accessible to water, right? If you're a leaf way up in the air, even if you're a leaf an inch off the ground, you're not really uh, getting water. Um, you're not absorbing it through your leaves because you have a cuticle and things like that. You need water to be brought in from the roots up into your leaves, into your, uh, your stem, so those cells can survive. They can also uh, transport sugars. So some plants, a good example of this are maple trees, 
will store sugars in their roots, um, especially during winter months, so that they can feed off of those sugars when it, when the winter passes and they need to make new leaves and they need to, you know, basically wake up from dormancy. And so they can also carry sugars. And a good example of this is the syrup that we eat. If you guys like pancakes or waffles and you like syrup on them, that's where it comes from. So people go and they put the taps in the trees early in the spring because all the sugar is being brought up that was stored in the roots up to the shoots. And if you put a tap in the tree, you can collect that really sugary uh, substance, boil it down and make maple syrup. Okay, also getting back to it. The um, cells that make up the xylem are actually dead cells, but they're connected end to end. So in this image, they're trying to show you that this is one cell and then this is another cell, all right? So this is a, so I'll show you a cross section of the xylem and phloem with these two cells. And in between the cells, because they're stuck end to end, they have these holes, which are shown here, these little pores. And water and the minerals and sugars that are um, in that water, that are dissolved in that water, flow through those pores from cell to cell to cell to cell. And this is how we end up with that kind of tube and that allows water to transport across, um, across the various parts of the plant. When water is needed by cells in a particular area, the water just exits through the cell wall. There are holes in the cell wall. And so these over here are cells that need water. The water will exit the tube and become available to whatever cells, if a leaf cell or stem cell or whatever, uh, cell in the stem that needs that water. Um, xylem are very rigid and, be, and part of that is because they're dead. Um, and so they are able to also pro provide structural support to the plant in addition to transporting water. So they kind of have dual purposes here. So how does this all work? How do we even get water from the roots to the shoots if there's no heart, right? Well, the key to this is actually evaporation. The one thing we talked about we don't want to happen, we actually also need evaporation. So water is moved from the roots, even in the tallest trees, to the shoots via something called cohesion, cohesion tension mechanism. And essentially what happens is water is always being evaporated from the leaves of the plant. They're trying their best using the cuticle to uh, keep as much water as possible. But like I mentioned, the stoma have to open. They need to exchange gas. And also it's hot. Water is going to find a way out. So water is always being evaporated from the leaves of the plants. And when it gets evaporated, it basically... Uh, is moving from an area of low con high concentration, which is in the xylem, to low concentration in the air. So diffusion. If you don't remember diffusion, go back and remember it because it's going to be important. Diffusion and osmosis. So when that when as that happens, it actually pulls on the water molecules that are attached to it, if you will. So remember back in your uh, 1103 class. They talked, you probably talked about how water molecules undergo hydrogen bonding with each other. And these bonds are generally pretty weak. But when you combine a whole bunch of hydrogen bonds between a lot of water molecules, it can actually be a pretty strong force. And so that's why we have like surface tension on water and things like that is because once you kind of add this cumulative effect of each individual hydrogen bond, it's a pretty strong um, force to be reckoned with. And that, that concept is also used here. So water molecules are being evaporated out, but they're also hydrogen bonded to other water molecules. So when they leave, it pulls the water molecule behind it kind of forward. And because of the cohesion between all the water molecules in, in, within the, uh, the xylem, it ends up pulling all of them. So if you can imagine a, a, a chain, Let's say you had, uh, you know, have you ever had those beads on a chain? So there's like a chain and there's beads, right? Let's say each of these beads was a mo water molecule and there was a spot right here, right? That was like a hole or something. If I pull that top bead up, what happens 
to the second bead. Well, that second bead is now on top of that line. Oh no. Okay, so that second bead is now on top of that line. And if I keep pulling, then now that third bead is on top of that line, right? And that's essentially what's happening here with these water molecules. They're being pulled from the roots all the way up the stem, all the way up through the leaves and out. And this is how water is transported. It's amazing, <laughs> especially if, because it works in even the tallest trees. But this, do you know how strong this process is and how amazing it is that water is able to um, have these hydrogen bonds and stick to each other so well that it can pull its way through a tree? It can only go so far. So trees can't grow infinitely tall, but um, you can imagine that even the tallest trees we have today go through this process to get water to where it needs to go. The other vascular tissue we have are phloem, and phloem are responsible for transporting sugars from areas that are responsible for making the sugars, so the leaves via photosynthesis, to areas that need the sugars. So this can be the fruits, flowers, stems, roots, and even budding leaves. And when you talk about phloem, generally people will say that they run from the source, which is where the sugars are being produced in the leaves, to the sink. And these are the areas that need the sugar. And uh, an example of this um, source to sink being actually a reversible process is in this case of a budding leaf. So when a leaf is budding, it cannot undergo photosynthesis yet, but it still needs sugars to grow. And it actually will get its sugars from already mature plants that are producing those carbohydrates. And so the, uh, at that time when the leaf is budding, the phloem will run from the source, the plant the leaves that are already mature to the sink, the bud. But once the leaf is mature and is undergoing photosynthesis itself, the phloem will no longer run in that direction and it will actually run in the opposite direction to different areas that need those sugars. And so the process of where the, the source to sink, where the phloem runs, can be reversible in some cases. So I mentioned that it moves sugars from the leaves to whatever tissues needed. And um, just to clarify, this is not granules of sugar running through these, uh, these tubes. Actually, it's dissolved sugar. So vast majority of it is actually water. And the sugar is dissolved in water, which allows it to flow. There's also other nutrients that are present within this water that are um, needed by other plant uh, other cells within the plant the sugar that's most common in this phloem sap which is what they call it um, is actually sucrose which we all know is very very sweet we use it in a lot of our food the phloem unlike the xylem are actually living cells so in this picture they're trying to show you two different cells or a couple of different cells the first cell is and there's like a diagonal line here and then our second cell is down here, right? But they also still are put end to end, so they make these tubes. And these tubes are called the sieve tubes. And um, there are have these holes as well in their ends, just like we saw with the xylem, that allow for the flow of fluid between the the cells of this that make up these sieve tubes. When sugars are needed. For certain cells, they can exit the sieve tube via holes or pores on the outside of the tube that allow it to exit. So in this picture, they're showing you a pore here, a pore here, a pore here. But essentially, there are holes in the cell wall, these pores, that will allow the, the, the sugar to leave as needed. The um, cell wall in the phloem is actually much, much thinner than the cell wall in the xylem, so they're not actually able to provide as much structural support as we saw with the xylem, but they're still equally um, important. So how does this process work of getting sugars into the phloem and then running them somewhere else and then getting them out? Well, this process starts, so let me erase these things, okay. This process starts in the leaves. So sugars are made and produced in the um, cells in the chloroplast of the leaves. And then those sugar molecules are actively pumped into the phloem. So that's what it's showing you here. Sugar molecule 
is pumped into the phloem. And remember, when you talk about active transport, that means it requires energy. So ATP is used to pump the sugars from these cells undergoing photosynthesis into the phloem where there's already you know, water present. They basically follow that, that flow of water in, into whatever area they, they need to go. The water gets into the phloem from the xylem. So if you remember back when we talked about diffusion, it was all about the concentration of salts and solutes and solvents, right? So the concentration of salts, the sugars in this case, in the phloem is much, much higher than it is in the xylem. So water will, through osmosis, go from the xylem to the phloem. So that's how the water ends up there. The wa so the water is passively moving into the phloem due to uh, differences in salt concentration. And then the sugars are being actively pumped into the phloem and they flow to wherever they need to go. Once the sugars have reached an area where they're needed, they are actively pumped back out of the phloem to those tissues. And so that's what it's showing you here. So that's even more energy is being expended. So you can imagine you need these sugars to make energy, but to make the energy, you need these sugars. So it's kind of like a circular type of process here. But that's essentially how it works. Sugars are actively pumped into the phloem. Water is being uh, diffused into the phloem as well from the xylem. The, the, um, the sugars travel throughout the plant due, and this is also, I meant to mention, this is due to a buildup of pressure because the water is being built, pushed into the phloem. And so this builds up the pressure within the phloem and that's what causes the transport of the sugar molecules. And then once they reach where they need to go, the sugar molecules are actively pumped out of the phloem into those tissues. Our last tissue type are our ground tissues, and these are basically any tissues that aren't dermal or vascular tissue. So they make up the vast majority of tissues in the plant. There are three cell types that make up ground tissue. The first are the parenchyma, and they're basically the cells that are doing all the heavy lifting. These are the cells that make up the plants, uh, leaves, flowers, stems, roots, fruits, the majority of the cells that make up these structures are parenchyma. And like I said, they're doing the heavy lifting. So they're the ones that are undergoing photosynthesis, storing food, um, producing ATP, making hormones and releasing hormones. Those are the cells that are doing all that work. And uh, an example here that we're all pretty familiar with are the flesh of fruits and vegetables. So this whole area here, when you eat an apple, all of that kind of fleshy material in the middle that we love to eat because it's so sweet are actually parenchyma cells and they're sweet because they're storing sugars within that that fruit those fruit cells so that's one good example to remember so we have our colonchyma cells and colonchyma cells are uh, these elongated flexible cells they have a thick uh, cell wall and they're responsible for allowing some flexibility in the plant a good example of this can be seen in the uh, stringy material in celery. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I hate that stringy material, especially because it gets in my teeth. But it's there to provide some flexibility to celery. So if you ever take celery, you can bend it back and forth pretty good. And that's because of these colonchyma cells. Then we have our sclerenchyma cells, and these are non-living cells, and um, they make up the lignin in the cell walls of plants, and they provide basically structure and support. For the next few slides, we're going to spend some time talking about the three main structures of the plant, the roots, the stems, and the leaves. First, the roots. So there are two types of roots that are present in plants, and we already kind of touched on them a little bit, but we have our fibrous roots, which are the ones that kind of branch out from the bottom of the stem. They don't really go as deep into the soil as the second type of root we're going to talk about, but they're able to branch out faster and they grow, grow faster. Um, so there are some benefits to that. And then we have our tap root. And our tap root is when you have a central kind of root column and then smaller roots kind of branch off from that main root. And some benefits to this are you're able to store more um, sugars and things like that in a tap root than you are in a fibrous root. And they're also able to dig deeper into the soil so they're able to anchor more and get more nutrients further down. 
However, they are energetically expensive. So you can see pros and cons to both these types of roots depending on the needs of the plant. Some examples that you've probably seen in your grocery store. Um, an example of a fibrous root can be seen with leeks. So the bottom of leeks, this is a really good example of a fibrous root. And then we have our tap root. Our examples are like uh, carrots, beets, and things like that. A carrot is a really good example because if you've ever had a carrot and you leave it in like the sun too long and you let it like sit for too long, you'll start to even see those little roots kind of branch off of it. So um, keep those in mind as examples when you're thinking about these different type of roots. So a root uh, is all there to provide a couple of functions. One, the main one, to absorb water and nutrients from the soil. And also within this, um, there's also dissolved minerals. So there's more than just sugar and water are needed by the plant. There are a lot of minerals that are required and a lot of those minerals actually come from the soil. And then also roots are able to engage in absorption of oxygen, especially in the case of trees that are submerged, their roots are submerged in water. So if you've ever been to a mangrove and you've seen a tree, I'm gonna have to draw a yellow tree, but you ever seen a tree and it's roots, and, let's see, and then there's water. And you see their roots will do like, like this outside of the water and then they go back in. They're doing that because this part of the root that's above the water is helping to absorb oxygen before they go back into the water. Because once it's in the water, there's not really much oxygen that's available to those roots. Roots are also responsible for anchoring the plant. Um, so we talked about in the last Pre, uh, last uh, presentation that the roots are able to help anchor the plant so that it can grow tall and resist gravity, right? So that's really, really important for the upwards growth of plants. And then they're also responsible for storage. Um, so we talked about in like maple trees, they can store sugars, but not just that, carrots, beets, all those different types of things are able to store sugars in the roots for the plant as it matures. Every major part of the plant, this includes the stems, the roots, and the leaves, all have the three tissue pipes, the vascular, ground, and dermal tissue. The differences lie within um, how they're organized between monocots and dicots. So we're going to start by looking at a taproot in dicots. So in dicots, they have their, the very, very center, at the core of their root, they start with their xylem. And then external from the xylem, they have their phloem. So at the core of the dicot tap root is our vascular tissue. And when you look at this image here, this horizontal cross section, you can see that the xylem kind of bulges or protrudes out between the, the phloem. So the phloem is here, 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 and here. And then our xylem is all in the center region and then occupies the space with, between the phloem. And so um, that's kind of how you can start to see that organized structure that um, we talked about in the roots of dicots is because of this. And then external from the vascular tissue, we have our ground tissue and then our dermal tissue on the very, very outside. So this is in tap roots and dicots. In monocots, it's organized a little bit differently. We have, um, instead of the center being our xylem, in the center we actually have ground tissue. And uh, it's a very spongy parenchyma tissue that um, is called the pith. And then external from the pith, then we have our xylem, and then we have our phloem, and then more ground tissue, and then the dermal tissue. So it's a little bit different between the monocots and dicots. The roots of monocots and dicots both have these uh, root hairs and these hair-like projections that you can see here and then also in this image here, all that kind of fuzzy material um, in that image are root hairs. And they're basically elongated porous epithelial cells. And they're responsible for increasing the surface area of those roots and allowing for optimum uh, absorption of water and nutrients. So this is a very, very important aspect of roots, allowing them to be as effective as they are at bringing in water and nutrients to the plant. They can also underget, undergo gas exchange um, and bring in oxygen for the plant so they can undergo cellular respiration. So how does water get into, oopsie, so how does water get into the roots? Well, it's through osmosis. 
So in the soil, the concentration of solutes is lower, I mean, yeah, it's lo is lower than the concentration of solutes within the plant tissue. And so water from the soil will diffuse via osmosis into the um, tissues of the plant, right? So this is a process of osmosis going from a uh, low concentration of salts to a higher concentration of salts, and that's how water is passively brought into the roots. In the case of nutrients, it's a little bit different. So a lot of these uh, nutrients that the plant needs are charged, so they cannot freely move into the cell, and they also are moving against their gradient. So the concentration of those salts is higher, or those nutrients is higher within the plant cells than it is in the soil. So to bring those in, you have to actually use active transport. So you have to expend ATP in order to actively pump those nutrients from the soil into the plant cell. A very important aspect of uh, the plants as we know it and the, um, the root structure is this thing called mycorrhiza. And mycorrhiza is a mutualistic symbiotic relationship between plants and a fungus. And so when you're looking at this image here, this kind of darker brown down here and then this here is all plant root. But any of these kind of, uh, let me try and draw in green, all this kind of spider webby looking material, all of this here and this here, it's very thin filaments, it's actually a fungus. And so the fungus basically coats the roots of the cell, I mean the roots of the plant, and um, it helps with absorption of water and nutrients for the plant. So um, it's very, very beneficial for plants to have mycorrhiza around, and some plants actually won't even grow without mycorrhiza present in the soil and on their roots. This relationship is not one way, like I mentioned it's mutualistic, so the mycorrhiza, um, the fungus, actually benefit as well because they get to consume the sugars from the plant's roots. So the plant gets additional absorption of water and nutrients, and then the fungus gets the sugars that the plant is making. So it's a really beneficial relationship for both parties. Our next major structure are our stems. And stems are responsible for doing a couple of things. One, for providing structural support to the plant. So as the plant is growing vertically and, and taller and taller, the stem is able to produce uh, that structural support that the plant needs to keep it from falling over. Also, the stem is responsible for positioning the leaves to uh, optimize their exposure to sunlight so they can undergo as much photosynthesis as possible. And then finally, they also house vascular tissues. So, you know, vascular tissues are present in the stems and the leaves and the roots. Um, and essentially, the stems is where the middle ground is. So they run from the roots or the shoots and they all pass through the stems. So stems grow from two major uh, areas and both are referred to as the meristem. So we have um, the apical and the lateral meristem. And meristems are areas of uh, high density of undifferentiated cells. And so these undifferentiated cells are basically like stem cells for the plant. And um, they multiply to become other undifferentiated cells or they can multiply and become differentiated cells. And so when we're looking at our apical meristems, those are at the tips of the branches. And these are areas that are responsible for incre increasing the length of the branch. And then we also have our lateral meristems, which I'll show you in an image soon, but they're responsible for increasing the girth of the branch. And then also branches, they, uh, well, not branch, stems, they can branch. That's why some branches we call branch. Um, so they branch at these places called the nodes. So this is a node and this is a node. And these are areas where the stem has basically veered off into two different directions, um, allowing for um, more and more kind of stems to kind of branch off and, and, and extend. This is referred to as segmented growth. So looking at uh, like a cross section of a stem, what does it look like? So uh, we have our lateral meristem, which is this ring that runs right here 
is what we talked about where I said I showed you the, the lateral mer mer meristem, which houses the undifferentiated cells that are responsible for increasing the uh, girth of the, of the stem or the branch. Uh, that's where that is located. And then in our dicots, we have a central area that's called the pith. And this is our ground tissue that kind of lies in the middle of the, of the branch. And it's surrounded by our vascular tissue, which is our, our xylem, which are depicted here in blue, and our phloem depicted in green, I mean in, in pink. And then we have our ground tissue, well, more of it that lies on the outside of our vascular tissue, and then our uh, dermal tissue on the very, very outside of the stem. And then in our monocots, very similar structure, um, well, similar components, slightly different structure. So the, the dicots, it was a very organized setup, right? You can, almost like an orange, if you will, how organized it is. But in our monocots, we don't have that same type of structure. Our xylem and phloem, our vascular tissue bundles, are kind of randomly or haphazardly distributed throughout some ground tissue and it's all surrounded by dermal tissue here. So they also look a little different. So yes, we saw differences in the roots, but there's also differences in how the stems are structured between monocots and dicots when you look at them in a cross section. We also have very various modified stems that you may not even recognize as stems. And uh, this is something that I learned through you know taking this class that bulbs are actually not roots. They are a modified stem. So when you plant your tulips, I had always thought those, those were roots. They're actually not, they're modified stems. Uh, runners, so runners are, if you guys have ever had those house plants where they almost look like a vine, you'll have a, uh, a leaf and then there's like a vine, right? And then you might have some more leaves that branch off from this vine, but there are certain areas where they'll kind of have these little bitty roots that will pop out. And those little roots, if you actually grew that plant on the ground, would anchor those uh, vines, those runners to the soil. And those are actually, um, those runners are modified stems as well. Um, they're not, uh, th well, they kind of look more like stems than, than a bulb does, but just know they're slightly modified. Instead of growing up, they grow along the ground. And then potatoes. Potatoes aren't a root. Um, they're actually a modified stem. And the reason why we know this is because they have eyes, right? And eyes are areas where they would actually start branching off and creating other stems. So that to me was surprising. I did not know potato was not a root until this class. Last but not least, we have our leaves. And I know you guys are sick and tired of hearing me say this, but the leaves are responsible for producing the sugars that the plant needs to survive. And they're able to do this via photosynthesis. And the organelle that's responsible for converting light energy from the sun into chemical energy in the form of sugars are the chloroplast organelles that are within the cells in the leaf. There are a variety of different leaf sizes and shapes and colors out there. Um, there are very massive leaves. There's some really tiny small leaves, ones that are kind of long, some that are more fat. There are leaves, most of the time we see them, they look like they're green, but there's also leaves that have a more purple color, white color, um, red color to them. So there's a lot of leaf variety out there. One of my personal favorites is depicted in this picture here, which is Swiss chard. Um, I literally like it because of those striking red veins against that green fleshy part of the, the leaf um, is always kind of really beautiful to look at. So despite all the variety we see in leaves, they have one thing in common. They're all thin. And this is because sunlight can only penetrate so many layers of cells before it's either all absorbed or reflected. And so if you're a plant, you don't wanna spend a lot of energy making more and more and more uh, cell layers to have thicker and thicker leaves um, if they're not gonna benefit you. If the sunlight is only able to go through a certain number of uh, cell layers, then you're generally probably gonna to wanna to stop around that number so that you can optimize as much photosynthesis as possible, but minimize the amount of energy you're spending making um, these leaves. Uh, we also have some modified leaves out there. 
an example can be seen here with the spines of a cactus. So these are actually modified leaves and they don't undergo photosynthesis, but they do help the plant in a variety of other ways. One, they help to reduce evaporation in the kind of dry, arid temperatures where cactus, cacti usually uh, are found. They also help to capture moisture at night and they help to protect the plant from predation. So they don't undergo photosynthesis, but they really help the plant survive in a variety of other ways. So let's look at the leaf structure. So going from top down, so let's say you're looking at the, the top of a leaf, the waxy part, we have our cuticle. And our cuticle is this very thin waxy layer at the very, very top. And uh, it, you know, remember it's supposed to protect the cell, I mean, protect the, the leaf from predation, from bacteria, fungi, and insects, but it's also, and more importantly, involved in the uh, retention of water within the leaf. So to prevent evaporation from the tissues so the leaves don't dry out. Beneath that, we have our epidermal cells. And they're depicted here. And there's a layer of epidermal cells as well on the bottom of the leaf on the opposite side. And these epidermal cells are um, mainly protective. They serve a role to protect the cells beneath them. They're not photosynthetic, but they're essential um, because one, they provide protection for all of the photosynthetic cells that lie beneath them, but also because they produce the cuticle. So that waxy substance is uh, derived from these epidermal cells. Beneath that, or between these two layers of epidermal uh, cells, we have our uh, mesophyll. And so that's all these cells here. And there are two types of mesophyll. We have our pal palisade mesophyll, which is here, which is close to the top part of epidermis. And these are closely packed, very tightly packed photosynthetic cells. They undergo a lot of photosynthesis for the plant. And then we also have our spongy, meso, uh, spongy mesophyll, which are depicted here. And these cells are kind of a little bit more abnormal shaped and uh, they're more farther spaced from each other. And this allows for CO2 to actually um, kind of surround these cells um, and they're able to use that CO2 during um, photosynthesis to make sugars. So uh, those are the two types of mesophyll. Palisade mesophyll, or these tightly packed photosynthetic cells, and then our spongy mesophyll, which are our more loosely arranged uh, photosynthetic cells. And then also we have, um, in the middle here, we have our our uh, vascular tissue. And just as a reminder, in, in these images, the phloem is pink and our xylem is blue. And then they are surrounded by some ground tissue. Another important aspect to remember is on the bottom of the leaf, we have our stoma. So remember our stoma are these holes or these pores within the um, epidermis of the leaf that allow for gas exchange. And the stoma is flanked by two guard cells. And in this image here, here's kind of the stoma. Um, that's kind of hole, hole in the middle is the stoma. And the guard cells would be these two cells here. And they're responsible for um, kind of opening and closing that pore to allow for gas exchange, but also it allows for some evaporation so that the water can be pulled from the uh, roots through the stems to the leaves of the plant. So. That's kind of the, the structure of how leaves are laid out. In addition to um, the cuticle, there are a couple of other things that plants use to help re uh, reduce the amount of water that they lose due to evaporation. And this can be the use of hairs. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen a lamb's ear plant, but they're these cute little plants and they're real, real, real fuzzy. And they're, they're covered in these real small hairs. And those hairs help with um, what preventing water loss for those plants. Um, additionally, we talked about these guard cells that they're really, really important when it comes to if it's hot outside, the guard cells will deflate and they'll close the stoma so that the plant doesn't lose more water than it needs to. Um, so the cuticle, guard cells, and, and small hairs all play a role in protecting the plant from drying out due to evaporation. Alrighty, so now we've talked about are three um, major parts of the plant, the roots, the stems, the leaves. 
We talked about the different tissue types, dermal, vascular, and ground. And we talked about the different types of cells that make up those tissue types. So now there's one thing we haven't talked about much, where the, sand, where the plants grow, the soil, right? So plants need more than sunlight, which I've mentioned, water and air, which are the things that I've talked about a lot in this presentation. They also need soil. And what is soil? Soil is more than just a whole bunch of dirt, right? Um, soil is composed of minerals, organic material, water, and air. So soil is about 50% minerals. Yikes. And those minerals come from actually the breaking down um, of rocks over time. So as water erodes rocks and things like that, those minerals become part of soil, a large part of soil. And uh, there are are three different types of soil. We've got our sand, silt, and clay. So sand particles are kind of farther apart. So when you have sand, you guys all have been to the beach or to a desert. Sand is kind of readily flows through your hands and really, you know, moves. And that's because the sand particles, um, the grains are further apart. They're not really closely attached. And then we have our silt, and silt grains are a bit closer together, and so it allows for more water retention, um, and more and a little bit less air, but a lot more water retention when you have silt. And then you have clay, and in clay, the clay particles are really close together, making them very very good at retaining water. Um, so good sometimes that they can become waterlogged and you can't even get any air in there for the plant to grow. So optimum soil actually has a mixture of sand, silt, and clay um, to allow for the um, proper amount of you know, structure and support, but as well as water and air to get in there. There are 13 essential minerals that plants need that's present in soil. And these include nitrogen, phosphorus, um, magnesium, potassium, sulfur, and calcium, with nitrogen being by far one of the most important of, of these minerals where a plant can't even grow without it. So keep that in mind. We'll talk a lot more about nitrogen in just a second. The other parts of soil, um, another, the second major part of soil is water and air makes up about 45 to 50% of soil. And then the last part is the organic material which makes up approximately one to 5%. And this organic material originates from decomposing carbon containing matter. So this can be leaves, uh, dead animals, dead bacteria, all those like dead material that's decomposing is what provides that organic material, um, those carbon containing molecules for the plant. Soil is not ever like great, like it's not forever great. That makes more sense. Um, it doesn't always have the right amount of nutrients and organic material um, at all times. As a plant grows in soil, it will remove those nutrients and unless they're being replenished, they're gone. And so a lot of times uh, we as growers or as farmers or agriculturalists uh, or even growing gardening novice, um, we have to replenish those nutrients in the soil. And there's a couple ways we can do that. Um, one via composting. So when you take your your lawn clippings or your food, um, your like uh, leftovers from fruits and veggies and things like that, and you compost them, you can now use that as fertilizer for your plants. You can use chemical fertilizers. And then in the case of large scale agriculture, people will rotate their crops. Um, certain crops will um, take more nutrients from the soil than others, especially when it comes to nitrogen. So you'll, you can't grow one type of crop on a piece of land year after year after year after year forever. You have to switch it out with other plants that are able to help actually replenish some of those nutrients in that soil so that you can grow something else there later. Um, so I mentioned that soil is important and essential actually for plants to grow. You can actually grow plants without soil. You can grow them hydroponically, uh, which means you just have water. 
plants in just some water, there is no dirt involved. But when you grow plants hydroponically, you have to make sure that you still include all these nutrients at the exact right concentration that they need to be in in soil for the plants to grow. So um, if you've ever looked at a hydroponic garden, they are amazing. That's something that I hope to do one day. But it's very, very difficult because you have to make sure you're always keeping up with the nutrients that are present in the water and keeping them at just the right levels. So I mentioned that nitrogen is by far probably the most important mineral um, to a plant. And basically it's second to water as being like essential as far as things go. And this is because nitrogen is used to make proteins, made, used to make DNA, it's made used to make a variety of different cell structures. Um, it is absolutely essential for a cell to grow and function. And so how do they get their nitrogen? So there's nitrogen in the air everywhere around us in the form of N2. And N2 is basically two nitrogen molecules that are bonded to one another. This is a very, very stable molecule, um, but it's inert. A plant cannot use N2 to make anything in its cells. Um, that N2 actually has to be converted to ammonium or nitrate, which is NH4 plus or NO3 minus. Um, so ammonia or nitrate in order for the plant to actually use it. The nitrogen in air is actually made bioavailable by bacteria. And these bacteria have an enzyme called nitrogenase. And basically it converts into to ammonia or nitrogen, I mean uh, nitrate. This is actually a very energetically expensive process, um, but it highly benefits the plant. So why would the bacteria do it? It's because they also benefit. So have you guys ever seen these little bumps on the roots of a plant? Like you went and pulled up particularly like legumes, bean plants, pea plants will have these little bumps, nodules on the roots. These are actually not some sort of tumor. These are, uh, these nodules are actually involved in nitrogen fixation. So these bacteria that are responsible for um, fixing nitrogen can live freely in the soil but um, in some cases, they can actually live within the roots of the plant. So that's what these nodules are. It's these bacteria living within the roots of the plant and um, fixing nitrogen for that plant. This is very common in legumes, like I mentioned, and, and in pea plants and things like that. So how this works is the root of the plant will put out different chemicals that will attract the bacteria, the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Nitrogen-fixing bacteria will uh, embed themselves into the roots, the th root tissues, and start to replicate there. And as they're replicating, you know, they're giving more and more and more and more of them. And that's how you end up with these nodules on the roots. And essentially, they'll just live there. And they'll take in nitrogen from the, from the air and from the soil um, in the form of N2. And they'll convert it to, uh, to ammonia or nitrates. And... Um, what they benefit is that while they're doing this, undergoing this process, they actually will eat the uh, sugars that the plant is producing that are in the roots. So the bacteria benefit because they get the sugars from the plant. They don't have to go anywhere for it. And to a certain degree, they get protection from any other predators that um, may want to feed on those bacteria. And then on the opposite end, the plant benefits because they get the vital nitrogen that they need in order to survive. So this is a very, very strong example of mutualism. And there are some uh, species of plant, actually many species of plant, that without these nodules um, being present, they won't grow at all and they'll actually just straight up die because they can't get the nitrogen they need. This relationship is not present in all plants. Some plants have to um, basically scavenge um, the nitrogen they can from the free living nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil. So for things like legumes, it's nice because as you're growing, you don't have to worry about nitrogen fixing bacteria being in the soil. They're in your roots, but many, many plants don't have this luxury. So they must absorb nitrogen, um, as it's being made from free living, uh, from free living bacteria within the soil. 
And then some plants don't have either of those luxuries. So some plants grow in nitrogen poor soils. These soils may be too acidic for the nitrogen fixing bacteria to live in. So they have to find their nitrogen some other way. And the way that they do this is through eating insects. So we talked briefly about insectivores in the last presentation, and I'm just gonna mention them briefly here, is that some plants have to uh, eat insects. And when, in this case, you see this Venus flytrap is about to eat this, this unsuspecting fly, and uh, they will dissolve and digest that, that insect and use the nutrients it gets from it to, um, to support its own growth. And a lot of times the nutrient that they're looking for by eating these insects is nitrogen. With that said, we've reached the end of this presentation. Um, I know that you guys are probably like, I've learned far more about plants than I ever wanted to know. Uh, we have one more chapter left covering plants and then we'll move on to fungi. But um, for now, just go ahead and read chapter 19, sections 19.2 to 19.6, 19.10, and then 19.12 to 19.14. And then also do the learning curve assignment. And then any of these videos that uh, you think will help you to uh, understand any of the uh, structure and function of vascular plants, feel free to watch them and hopefully they'll help submit these ideas and concepts in your mind. All right, excellent. I'll see you next time for our last uh, major talk on plants.